If we look in terms of nearness and distance, how this relates to human beings, nearness is related to gratitude. Distance is related to ingratitude. Nearness is related to Iman. Distance is related to Kufr. So if a person accepts God and wants and strives to come to know God, that is a drawing near process. This is where we differ from the angels. The Quran says, there is no angel except that he has a fixed place. The angels are fixed. It's not an upwardly mobile uh, job. They are fixed. The, the cherubim, muqarrabun, are the nearest. And, then the, uh, and also the great angels, Jibra'il, Israfil, Seraphiel, Mikael. These are the close angels in the angelic realm. But they are fixed. They don't disobey God. They only obey God out of jabr, compulsion. The human being has this interesting aspect to him or her. And that is the human being can choose one of two things. This is where we begin our journey. The Quran talks about two <coughs> phenomena. One is called darajat, which are upwardly. Darajat means stairs moving up, Jacob's ladder. Darakat are stairs moving down. Darakat are easy. Darajat are hard. And the difference between them is the jim letter and the ka letter. The jim letter in the Arabic uh, uh, science of the letters is a shidda letter. It's a hard letter. The ka doesn't have the same shidda. It doesn't have the same hardness. An individual at this point, as a child, it is born according to the Muslims in what's called the fitra nature, which is submission. The very first state of the child before the nafs begins to develop, and I'm going to explain the nafs. The very first state of the human being is submission. There is a famous teacher from Morocco. One of his uh, students asked him, how do we come to God? How do we arrive to God? He went upstairs and he came down with a newborn. And he said, until you're like this, you don't arrive to God. Right? Until you're like this, you don't arrive to God. The idea is until you are helpless before God, until you recognize what your human attributes are in relation to the divine attributes. Because we do, we are God-like. You see, the human being is God-like. You know, Shakespeare's idea of, of the paragon of animals. Right? How like a God, this human being. This form, the symmetry, the will, the volition, the power, the sense of independence, the ability to transform, the creative capacity within the human being. The human being is godlike. But this is delusional because he is only godlike in relation to creation. When the human being relates himself to the creator, he becomes the most pathetic of creatures. He becomes the most helpless of creatures, the most incapacitated. We can't survive for a few minutes without air. There was once a, a Buddhist monk who, he was a master, had his student, came to him and he said, I want to achieve enlightenment. He said, the first thing you have to do is learn how to breathe. He said, well, I know how to do that. I've been breathing all my life. He said, no, no, you have to learn how to be conscious of your breath. He said, why should I learn how to be conscious of my breath? 
So he had some of his students take him to a river next to the monastery and hold him under. <laughs> and then brought him up. And he said, now do you know why? In other words, we forget how quickly we can lose our breath. How quickly we can become helpless. Because we feel this sense of independence. And until we start becoming aware of our weaknesses, our inherent weaknesses, the most subtle is breath itself. Because we are one breath away from death. Literally one breath away from death. So the fitra nature is that a child is in submission to God. As the nafs begins to develop, the first nafs that shows up, and nafs here is a very important word in the Islamic tradition. And I'll just go through a little bit in uh, the semantic field of nafs. The root word is, is again nafasa. You have it in Hebrew also, nefesh. Nefesh is breath or spirit. And also, interestingly enough, uh, psyche in Greek, same meaning, spirit, nefesh, to breathe. It's related to breath, right? Nefesh has two, at its base root, it has two meanings, nefisa and nefusa. All you do is change a voweling. One of them means to be precious, and the other means to be niggardly. So right there, in the Arabic language, there is a concept embedded in the idea of self, that we have two aspects to our nature. One is the bestial, and the other is the angelic. One is the selfless, and the other is the niggardly. One is the one that wants to give, and the other is the one that wants to hold on. And this is the human dichotomy. At the next level, if you go to the next root, which is nefasa, where you put a shedda over it, so it's, it would look like this. Same root though. Nefasa means to help somebody, to relieve them of their constriction. In other words, to give them breath, to help them, to expand somebody who's constricted. But you go to the next root, Nafasa. And it means to undermine somebody else, to compete against them. So it's right there in the language, the human being has these two opposing qualities. For the child, at the first level, you can see this already. One is that the child will smile and give, uh, the mother melts the heart, right? I mean, people, you watch people's faces when they're looking at the baby and doing the, and when the baby smiles, they all get, like they start <laughs> kind of melting, right? Why? Because it's like a gift from that baby. But then it starts screaming, I want. So right there in the, in the baby, we begin to see the emergence of the dual nature and we see it through childhood I mean, I have a five and a three-year-old, and you can see them moving between these two states. This, this amazing state of wanting to give, wanting to share, and then this other state of wanting to hold on, I'm not going to share. Right? Negation, affirmation. The world is negation, the next world is affirmation. Negating the world, affirming God. This is the human being. We are negators and affirmers. But if we get it wrong, what we should be negating and we're affirming, we go into trouble. So the first nafs is called nafs al-amara. And there's an interesting book by Robert Bly, for people that like him, some people can't stand him, but I like him. There's, there's a book he wrote called The Sibling Society, which is about modern America. Because he's got this idea that Americans are turning into big babies, right? That they've lost this kind of sense of moving into maturity. And he uses the Islamic model of saying that many of us have become this nafs al-amara. Amara means the commanding self. It is the self that is commanding us to do things that we shouldn't do. And if we submit to that self, we become a slave of our passions. And this in the Arabic uh, language is called abd. The Prophet said, wretched is the slave of the dinar and the dirham, of gold and silver. Wretched is the slave of his clothes. Wretched is the slave of his uh, riding beast. People that become slaves of stuff, of the world. 
So nafs al-amara is the commanding self. Now the next move up is called nafs al-lawama. This is the blaming self, the reproachful self. The self is moving out of its, of its, uh, its abject nature. And it's beginning to recognize a type of moral imperative. The nafs is still doing wrong, but it's saying, I shouldn't be doing this. And this is consciousness. This is moving out of a completely bestial state and into a state now where there is a tension between the bestial and the angelic uh, nature of the human being. And this is best related to the idea of Adam السلام, being created from earth and water. Water is a purifying element by its nature. Water in many traditions is related to consciousness. If you go into the Chinese tradition, water is related to consciousness. The element of water itself. Earth is density. Now, water allows light through. Light can penetrate water. But light does not penetrate earth. So the human being is mixed with these two admixtures of, of earth and water. That we have one aspect of ourselves does not want to let the light through and another does. And this is where you go into the nafs al -lawama, The reproachful self. You shouldn't have done that. Right? And this is, this is I mean, some people have, uh, modern people have put this into the idea of the id and the ego. And then the super ego. You know, the id is more like the nafs al -amara, the compulsive self. And then the final self is called nafs al mutmainna which is the self at peace this is the self that's submitted this is the self that has submitted completely its being to god and this self is no longer in this conflict this is no longer in the religious state of I should do that or I ought to do that but now it is moved into Kierkegaard's kind of ethical self it now realizes that this is the right thing and it wants to do it it wants to do the right thing and it does the right thing now by nature not by compulsion not by feeling I have to do this thing so the human being has two choices to submit to the low self and take himself into alienation, which is wrath, which is transcendence. To literally place himself in a relationship to God in which God is absolutely other, disconnected from God completely. And this is epitomized by the idea of Jehennam, the idea of hell. That this is the ultimate alienation now, fire is a very interesting element because it can't rise above its nature. It has an upward motion, but it can't rise above because it's bound to the earth. You see, that the fire only exists because of earth. And yet it has this upward motion. It wants to, it's moving up, but it's held down by, and this is the idea of being pulled down. You see, being pulled down by fire. And fire is very similar to light. It's not light, but it's very similar to the concept of light. I mean, there is light in fire, but it's not the light of, that we relate to the spiritual light, luminosity. The other is an upward movement. Now, there is a tradition that the Prophet Muhammad said, وسلم, the fire is surrounded by desirable things. And paradise is, is surrounded by undesirable things. The idea here is, if we look at the pure outwardness of something and not at, at its inwardness, and we submit to the outwardness, that an outward thing can look very desirable, but what are its inward realities? So for instance, for a man who 
uh, submits to his lusts, which is a very common, one of the seven deadly sins and very common uh, human experience. There is something desirable, obviously, for a male and a female to have a sexual relation. At the physical level, it can be very physically stimulating experience. But if we look at it outside of its social context, that desirability might be there. If we begin to place it within a societal context, what are the implications of this act? What are the implications of my sleeping with another person without any social responsibility? Because one pregnancy often can uh, result. So there's an other, there's a third. There's a third that is the result of the act. Also, what is it saying about intimacy in a culture in which the most intimate physical act becomes uh, profane to the degree that it has no emotional content? In other words, there are deep implications to the act itself. If we look at it from its desirability, it's a downward motion. If we look at the aspects that might be less desirable, such as commitment. Commitment is, is, is a difficult thing to make a commitment. There are things that are going to be difficult that relate to it. But what is the inward reality? So outwardly, there are many people in this culture who do not want to commit to marriage because it's undesirable for them. They want to be free. I'm upwardly mobile. I don't want to be tied down. I mean, they see it tied down. That's undesirable. Foot loose and fancy free. That's how I want to be. What are the long-term effects of that? You see, what are the long-term effects? So outwardly, there are many desirable things. But then inwardly, there are many undesirable things. Just as outwardly, there are many undesirable things, but inwardly, there are many desirable things. So what the Quran, in a sense, really is trying to do is to get people to think deeply about things. And this is why it constantly talks about thinking about the aqibah. What is the long term? What is the subsequent results of the action? So this, this is, is in a sense, is a model of human uh, potentiality in terms of its upward movement and also degradation in terms of its downward movement. Most people are in conflict. Many people are not in conflict. They have submitted completely to this downward motion and other people are struggling to move up. And some people are moving up. Now in the modern world we've become, I think, quite cynical in, in a lot of ways, but I think the ancients probably had, uh, it was just that there was, there was a, you know, a sense of, uh, of this, even within our Western culture, there was a strong sense of the idea of, of this upward movement, that it was humanly possible. You know, the, the uh, dark night of the soul, St. John of the Cross, this type of idea that, that one could really achieve a type of power over the self and, and have completion and fulfillment in God. I think the difference maybe between that classical model in the Western world and the Islamic model would really probably relate to that, the idea that the Muslim model is not saying God that the world is bad. And the reason is, is because there's something, the world is seen as literally a theater of divine revelation. And, and the fact that God has made it a revelation means that it can't be bad. But to the degree that God is absent from the world, the world is bad. So in other words, there's a, two hadiths of the prophet. One said, the world is green and beautiful. And another one, he said, it's like a dead carcass. It's green and beautiful for the one who understands one's place in the world and honors that place and rises up to stewardship and uh, attempts to subdue the self and to be a caretaker. It is a carcass for the one who destroys his soul in the world and thus destroys the world as well. So the, um, 